Welcome to the Create What You Speak podcast. Join me as we have a real life discussion on how to change your life by changing your thoughts. Remember, question everything, trust yourself, and find your truth. Welcome to the Create What You Speak podcast. My name is Sloan Fremont, and I'm your host. This week, I want to start out the show with a question. And that question is, what is happiness worth to you? I know in my own life, I say I want to be happy. I talk to my friends about wanting to be happy. I talk on the show about wanting to be happy. But there are times that I end up doing things, my actions or my thoughts are actually the complete opposite of what I really believe it takes to be happy. So on this episode this week, we're going to explore that question. And my guest this week is Zara Carson, and she is the author of Six Weeks to Happy. So Zara, welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Sloan. It's my pleasure to be here. I'm really excited to talk with you about happiness because, um, like I said, that's something we talk a lot about on the show. I think it's something that at our core, we all want to be, but getting there sometimes there's a lot that can get in the way. Absolutely. Completely agree with you. So let's start out. Why don't you tell us just a little bit about you and what led you, what was the catalyst that led you to write six weeks to happy? (laughs) I, I think it was probably a lifelong journey. So I'll just tell you, I'll introduce myself a little bit. Um, So my name is Zara Carson. As you said, I'm an author and entrepreneur and CEO of a company called Get Zend. Um, I have a background in neuroscience and positive psychology, mindset coaching and consulting. And I've worked with C-level executives and in big, big projects up to 50 million. Um, I then started a coaching practice and built the Get Zend app. And I thought I started seeing patterns in all of the, the research with my with my clients, both in the you know, executive world and also just uh, my, my private coaching practice. And then I started seeing patterns in the data as well, neuroscience and positive psychology and psychology. And, you know, and then I was so interested in the studies of the subconscious. And you talk a lot about this in your show as well. And realize that we're 5% conscious mind, 95% subconscious. So if we can learn the tools to tap into that 95% and into that subconscious, we can actually reach our own, you know, the best version of ourselves. And so what I did was I tried to take the top strategies and I'm designed to be efficient. So I like things to be powerful and fast and I need to see results or I buy it. You know, I'm I'm like (laughs) the biggest skeptic ever. And so I thought, you know, as I started seeing these patterns and these are not difficult tools, I just, I was trying to wrap my head around how do I, how do I cultivate a set of tools and create a program so I can teach people how to do this long term because I think we all search for happiness as you say and then we run into these little roadblocks either internally with self-doubt or fear the self-sabotaging patterns and I thought what are the tools to really get people to create lasting change in their life whether they want more love or more happiness or greater wealth or better health for that matter and so I created the rewire system And I took the top 18 strategies and the whole concept of neuroplasticity, which is that the brain is not static. The brain is malleable. So if we can shift our thinking and feeling patterns and we can give the tools that people need to do that, to create that lasting change in just six weeks. And so that's what I did. I created a six week program where you can actually see lasting changes in the brain and the nervous system away from stress away from anxiety and back to calm, back to focus, back to being really empowered and productive. And so that's what I'm here to share with you all today. So that that whole system is covered in the book, Six Weeks to Happy. And I'm excited to be here and, and to talk about that today. Awesome. Well, that's amazing. And there's so much in that intro that you said about your, your background, um, what you learned. I really like how you talked about patterns in the data. I'm a data person as well. I've been in IT for a long time. And so patterns, data doesn't lie, right? If it's interpreted um, as the way it was set up to be, it, it doesn't lie. And so being able to find those patterns. And then really one of the key things you said there was the brain is malleable. We can change the thoughts. That's, that's the basis of the show, right? That's how I changed my life five years ago. I changed my thoughts. And as simple as that statement is, um, there's so much that goes into that. Right. And so when we, when we talk about happiness, let's start out, maybe what does happiness mean to you? 
I know that that might seem like a, maybe a generic question, but you know, it, it really at the heart of what we're talking about um, is happiness. So what does that mean to you? Well, it's actually a great question. It's much more complex than you would think. I mean, you can't just wake up and say, you know, what happiness is to me is living on the beach and getting to do yoga every day. It's not that simple. It's there's so many layers to it. And I think for most people, it escapes them because it feels like this elusive state of being. So for me, what happiness is, is, you know, it incorporates physical well-being. We need to feel healthy and strong in our bodies so that we can get through our day and through our life. But also, I think it encompasses, you know, a a peaceful, calm state of being where you really, you know, you have this deep inner knowing that the certainty that you are capable and deserving of all of the love and wealth and abundance and connection and, you know, all of those beautiful experiences that you're deserving of. For me, happiness also includes uh, giving back in some way. So, connecting my purpose. And obviously this work is, you know, the, with the purest intention, honestly, is, is really just to help people find that long lasting peace, find how to break through their own barriers. So for me, this is me on my soul mission or on my purpose. Um, So incorporating that into your life and realizing that there's an interconnectedness to all things. And if we all work together, you know, not only are we personally happier and and find that long lasting peace and connection that we seek, but we're also connected to this earth and to each other. And we get to look after each other on a whole different level if we have that deep understanding. So uh, cultivating that feeling and, you know, it includes resetting because we are, you know, we evolved to be good at survival and survival is very fear-based. Yes. Talk a little bit about that, you know, as we go in further into the discussion, but in in this discussion of happiness is how to program away from fear. So there are no more barriers to your success. There are no more barriers to love and connection. There are no more barriers to health, wealth, and happiness. And to that, you know, that freedom from worry and that freedom of time and that freedom of energy and that peace of mind that we all want to cultivate. So for me, if I, if I just wrap it up, (laughs) happiness includes, you know, a state of physical well-being where we feel like we're really thriving. We feel vibrant and energized every single day, but it's being in that headspace. You can call it the state of flow, but it's being in that headspace where we get to consciously think and feel what we want versus what's been driving us for so long. And that's a much more powerful place to live from. I agree. And one of the ways I describe happiness for myself is being friends with myself right? I'm, I'm being at home with me and it's not the external things. It's not any of that because it starts at home. If I'm not happy with me, none of the other things are going to make me happy. They're just going to be temporary uh, distractions from my own self. And you talk about moving away from fear and anxiety. And that's something I've, you know, we've all experienced, but I talk a lot about on the show because, um, that was the catalyst for me to change my life. And recently had a really interesting experience with fear and anxiety. I, I was, and, and I've done a show about this. So um, it, if, if the listeners are interested, they can go back and listen. So I won't get into it all right now, but it really came to this understanding of, of this feeling of separation, the separation from um, myself, from others. And, and when I separate myself, how unhappy I am. And that was a big, big, um, epiphany for me to, to really see the ways that I had separated myself, which has caused so much unhappiness. But then after that, after I'd came to that realization and that, um, those, that fear and anxiety started to kind of go away, I was left in this space of now what I'm so used to my thoughts and my, um, you know, my, my mind and my energy being occupied with all this fear and energy or with this fear and anxiety. So then it was like, now what? Right. And I kind of had a moment of panic because I was like, but I don't want to go back to the fear and anxiety. Right. I feel good. Like I I want to stay in this space. So can you talk a little bit about that when we're, when we're, cause sometimes it feels like we're chasing this happiness, right. We're, we're, we're trailing on the tail of it. That's how I feel at least maybe how I would describe it. So can you talk a little bit about that, about those feelings of chasing and then also maybe how we can think differently or do, do things differently to actually hold on to it? 
Sure. Well, I mean, great, great conversation and great question. I love this topic so much. And I love what you do because, you know, your this is your wheelhouse and this is also the particular area of fascination for me. So, you know, what is it that stops us? Why is happiness so hard to find? And what I came to realize is, like I said at the start, we were, you know, we evolved to be good at survival. So what that means is we have a built-in negativity bias, which means we're on high alert for danger. Now in the past, you know, living in, in the caves or in the bush or whatever, that served us well. So we had a fight or flight response that would get activated whenever we were in a moment of danger, let's say predator chasing us. And that fight or flight response acts like a gas pedal and it gives us this rush of adrenaline so that we can flee to safety. Now back then our brains would signal our bodies and say, okay, there's no more threat. It's okay to go back to calm. Well, in today's day and age, we're, we've forgotten, I think, that we have that natural ability to get back to calm and to reset our brain and central nervous system and so that we can think and focus and be productive. And so we sort of, over time, we've unknowingly um, strengthened our stress response, almost like a muscle at the gym. And we've forgotten like this calm muscle is just atrophied because we've forgotten we have a natural ability to do that. Anyone that studies medicine will understand. So your fight or flight response is run by your sympathetic nervous system. Your parasympathetic is the one that calms you down. So, and the quickest way to neurohack that is just stop, pause, and take six deep breaths. Mm -hmm. It literally triggers the brain to tell the nervous system and the body, it's okay to be calm again. But if you think about today's day and age, if I pick up my phone, I mean, we have how many different email inboxes coming into just email. And we have how many different social channels and we have text message and we have WhatsApp and we have Facebook messenger. I can't keep up with them all. Right. But what I know is every time my phone pings, it creates a little stress. It's like a little stress trigger almost because it's something that requires our time and our attention and anything that requires our time, money and attention is going to require energy. And I think in this life, we have become so overly stressed where we're chronically fatigued at this point. And we've forgotten that we, we have tools that we can access to retrain back to calm. And if we can do that, and that's what you did in this, in this last section of yours was, you know, you found your way back to calm and it does take up a lot of space. It takes up, it holds physical tension in your body, mm -hmm. that level of stress and anxiety. Because if you think of the physical symptoms of stress, you know, your neck and shoulders are tense. So there's muscle tension. Uh, your breathing is quickened and shorter, so you're not getting enough oxygen to feed you the way that you need to energize your body the way that you need. Your breathing is shallow. You may be, you know, you may be hunched over, and so right. you're holding. You're literally holding physical space for all of that. Mm -hmm. And when you let it go, what do you do? Well, that's part of why I wrote this book is because I thought, I thought if we can first teach people how to quiet the mind, then teach them how to go into all of those primal fears and remove the, the actual underlying causes that are, that are causing, and it's universal, by the way, that are causing us that level of stress and worry and anxiety on a day-to-day -day basis, then we get to sit in this wide open space. So as a coach, for example, you know, I get so many wonderful people come before me and they look so put together. And I think to myself, how is it that this person who looks so, you know, so together how is it that they haven't accomplished their goals in health, happiness, whatever it is, wealth, right. or money? And I realized as a coach, it's my, it's my goal to, it's my job to get into their model of the world because I need to understand sort of where they've constructed their walls and what their barriers to success are so that I start to dismantle it and help them pull it down. And then we have space because now you have possibility show up. You right. didn't have a barrier before that said, I don't think I can make that much money because I'm not educated enough or I'm not resourceful enough or, you know, maybe I can't find the love of my life because I've never been successful at love or I've always been alone or I've never had that sort of partnership from anyone or I'm not pretty enough or thin enough or whatever, whatever, whatever that the, yeah. is mm -hmm. we're telling ourselves. So you, you pull those walls down. And so I built those tools into the book because I thought, I need to give people a way to start to coach themselves, to recognize their own patterns and their own strategies. And then once you can actually pick those obstacles up and remove them and push them aside, now you have a space to clear. And here's the thing. 
nobody ever asked us in life, what makes you happy? <laughs> it's so simple. And yet nobody really gets asked that. We're told to go to school, get good grades, do well at sports, then somehow get a job, pick a career, do well in that, get more money, get the house, get the car, get the husband and wife, get the kids. Where in there is space to say, okay, but what do you need to really be happy in life, to feel like you're living your best life? And here's the thing, <clears throat> it's not a one size fits all answer. Every right. single person is unique. You may like CrossFit, I don't like CrossFit. You may like, you know, long walks on the beach at 6 a.m. I will tell you very clearly, I am a koala bear in the morning. I go so <laughs> slowly. <laughs> For my first two hours, you cannot force me to take an ice bath first thing in the morning. I know it's really good for you. It's revitalizing. You can't make me do that. So everyone's formula is really unique to them. So you have to figure out how to define your needs. So I've sort of put together an exercise that really breaks down the life wheel. So what do you need in terms of physical health and your environment? What do you need your home to look like to really help people dissect this for themselves so they can start asking those real questions? What do I need? Like if you could quantify it, you know, in hours or in events per week, how much do you need? Are you very social? Maybe your spouse is not. So how do you negotiate that time so you're both getting what you need so that your batteries are recharged so that you feel your best? Because it's very difficult to give anything to your life, to your partner, to your kids when you're on empty. Right. right? Yeah. And I think with this, um, you know, what we were talking about with the, with the negative thoughts and how that feels in your body, the mental energy it takes to, to, I always felt like the mental energy it took to fight myself, right. Cause I was constantly having a battle in my mind of, of you can't have this, but, but I want this. And the, all the thoughts that come with it, the, the amount of mental space that that's taken up there is, is massive. And I think that's, um, sometimes we don't maybe realize that I didn't until I had this recent event where I was like, wait a minute, I have a calmness about me. I have this openness. And, and you talked about that opening up the space for the new perspective and having that different perspective. When we, when we, when we stop those mental battles with ourselves, then we, we have room for those new perspectives. Right. And I, I have a, a sign in my living room that says um, in this moment, there is infinite possibility. I have it up to big, big, really big in my living room to remind myself of just because I think it doesn't mean it's true. Just because I have this limited perspective right now doesn't make it so. And we're not our thoughts. We have thoughts that can come and go, but we don't have to latch onto them and, ha and own them and, and, and believe them. And I think when we talk about happiness, like you mentioned, it's, it's, we're not often asked that, um, if we are, it's, it's maybe an afterthought it's in passing. It's maybe in a yoga class we do maybe, you know, once a week and we have a teacher who's asked us that question. Right. But having the, the now in the, I think it's such, so necessary with where everyone is in the world, right. With everything that, that we've experienced, it's, it's like, it's time to look at that. And we can't, take no for an answer. We can't keep doing this to ourselves of treating happiness as an afterthought. And we also, I think you, you touched on um, everyone's d definition or what they need to be happy is unique. We mm -hmm. have to stop thinking that everybody has, it's a one size fits all and that it has to be the same for everybody. We have to start opening up to the fact that it's okay if you don't want to get up early and do right. But I maybe do, right. Well, I don't, but just in the example, but you know what I mean? I think that there was so much, um, for so many years, we're taught this uniform, um, concept of what it means to be happy and, and fit into that, or there's something wrong with you. Right. But that's not the case. And it's, it's, I think these, uh, having these conversations about this are so important to start breaking your own mind with those, um, those pro that programming we've been up with. It's, it's, um, it's, it, it no longer works. You're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. And I think, you know, one of the things that's really important to note is, you know, our very nature, because we have this built-in survival mechanism, our very nature, it's it's built for survival. It's not actually built for happiness or success. So right. sometimes our very nature actually works counter to what we're trying to create in our lives, whether that's, you know, a state of 
overall happiness and well-being or to create wealth and success in our lives. So what are the tools you need to sort of dismantle that and to move beyond? And you're right, it does take so much energy to fight that. So, you know, I think of it as the four bodies. So we have a spiritual body, a mental, emotional, and a physical body. And most people, I think most people think of health as as our physical well-being. You know, how are you doing? Are you in the best shape of your life? You know, where what are your fitness goals? But I think the physical body is, yes, it is the physical body. It runs the organs. It runs the brain. It, you know, helps us with all of the, the, the background stuff, the breathing that we need and all of that. Right. But it's also a really great indicator for how we're doing in the other areas. So I'll describe the four bodies to you like this. The spiritual body, it doesn't matter what your faith is or what your spiritual, spiritual beliefs are. The, the spiritual body is really our connection to energy or source or the universal consciousness, if you will. And so energy sort of trickles down from your energetic body. And if you're starting your day off feeling peaceful, then that flows really nicely through. And it'll first enter your mental body. So your mental body is, you know, it's your thoughts, right? It's right. your, this is your decision making, your critical thinking. And, you know, it's, it's where you choose what you want to do and how you want to accomplish things in your life. And so that's where you set your goals in your mental body, your thinking mind. And energy flows from the mental body and it hits the emotional body. And the emotional body is what houses, you know, how you're feeling in the moment, sure. But also all of your past negative experience, whether or not you've succeeded or failed at things. And so when it hits the emotional body, let's say you've got a new challenge going on in your life and you're thinking, how do I approach this? And how do I accomplish this successfully? Well, once it it hits your emotional body, the brain actually says, have I done this before? And if I did, was I successful? Okay, let's take that path. It's the path of least resistance. But if you've tried and stopped or tried and failed or tried and been challenged and slowed down, all forms of not getting it, the brain says, oh, that's the path of least resistance. So let's let's trigger those thoughts and feelings. And so now we're tapping into, you know, that 5% conscious mind, 95% subconscious mind. We're tapping into all of those fears and self-doubts and self-sabotaging strategies that live in the emotional body and are stored as memory. So those get triggered and you start this new venture. Let's say you want to start a business and it says, oh, you know, we've tried this before. I'm not sure I have what it takes to accomplish this or to reach that next financial milestone or, you know, I don't think I have the resources to get there. And so the emotional body stops us, slows us down. And once we reach the physical body, that's where we get to take action. We're already stopped. Right. If you can find the tools to harmonize all four bodies, then you actually have the goal setter and the goal getter working together. And you can actually get to the end state, which I mean, I, I'm just fascinated by this whole topic. So that's what I, I explore and constantly research and I've poured all of that into the book. So I'm, I'm super excited. It's so, so powerful when you finally get to move that fear away. Yeah. And like you just had that moment of standing in this clear, wide open space and saying, okay, what do I want to create now? Right. What do I want to do with this space? And it's mine. It's mine to control, right? I don't, it, it's no longer seeking outside of me for uh, the answers or for the approval. It's it's mine to control. And when we have these, these parts of ourselves working together, you know, I've, I've found for myself, um, like you were talking about when you want to have another experience, you get, I get in a loop, right? I get in a loop of these thoughts and I talk myself into believing that it's, it's always going to be like it was before which is not true. It's just me buying into those thoughts and me having the argument with myself and me not, um, you know, there's probably a lot of, there's many things in there, but that, that looping then, um, is another level almost of exhaustion with that we put on ourselves because a lot of this is if, I mean, not that we know we're doing it. We, you talk about the five and 95% subconscious subconscious, but we're putting this on ourselves, right? We're, we're putting this suffering on ourselves unknowingly through some of these, these things that you're talking about. And, so I know you mentioned at the beginning about your rewire system. Can you tell us a little bit about that and, and um, how that works? Absolutely. And it's very fitting for this conversation because the rewire system, so re- rewire is an acronym and it's all based on the idea of neuroplasticity, which is 
that the brain shows lasting signs of change at 35 to 42 day period. Now I can go into, I won't go into like so much of the neuroscience geek part of me that will explain <laughs> dendrites, the neural pathways, but I'll explain it very, um, very generally in that if you wake up in the morning, for example, we have, you know, you can wake up and you can go and get your coffee and whatever your morning routine is. But then at some point, very soon after we awake, we start having thoughts about our day, right? All of the things we need to accomplish. And then those get tied in with feelings. And those feelings are, you know, stress and worry and nervousness. Do we have enough time and the energy to get through the day? And what ends up happening is if you think of that as a neural pathway, thoughts and feelings bundled together, when you wake up in the morning and you have that same thought that creates that same stress and you have another thought that creates the worry and another thought that creates the nerves, those get bundled together and hardwired together, almost like a coded memory. And so every time we wake up in the morning and we start to have that one thought, it triggers that whole bundle of thoughts. Yeah together it's like a, a like a, a, a picture like a um like an internet cord right that's pushing that energy without even having to think about it it's, it's become its own its own energy almost yeah it's almost like you're playing out a movie in your life that you've seen over and over and over again and you don't know how to break out and just be a different character that's more right. and you know more more effective and and producing the result that you want so the, the whole rewire system was based on this idea that if you can, you know, if these thoughts and feelings get wired together, how do we change that? And how do we create lasting change? Mm -hmm. And so I put together a set of tools. So if rewire is an acronym. The first one is about, is the R, it's how to relax and learn to quiet the mind. So three tools per week for six weeks. And that first set of tools teaches you you know, what you need to quiet the mind. If you don't want to sit in silent meditation, no problem. There's so many different ways you can do that. I have a friend that takes long walks. I have another friend that takes long bike rides and that's where he gets his greatest ideas and where all of his thinking and where he processes emotions and he feels so peaceful when he's done. So you can do it in a number of different ways, but just tap into the techniques you can to learn to quiet the mind. Then the second one is about eliminating noise. That's the E in rewire. And so this is where we do a little deep dive into, okay, what are the things causing that noise? Like, you know, when, when COVID happened and we, it's like you wake up and you have that little bit of noise in the background and we would just either hit the mute button or we dial the volume down and we just distract ourselves and get busy with the day. Well, COVID happened. We didn't have to get up and drop the kids off at school and go to the office. Right. And what happened, what happened was that little stress and, and worry and anxiety button, that volume got turned up. And so most of us reached for, we, you know, I think most people can say they felt extremely stressed or anxious at the start of all of this. Oh, and so, totally. Right. And well, and also how it left us with ourselves. We were alone with ourselves. For yeah. me, that was one of the first times that had ever, I had really ever truly understood what it meant to be alone with myself. Yes. And I think it created this. Like what you hear so far, take what you've learned and invest in yourself with the create what you speak Academy. Visit create what you speak.com to learn more. Now back to the show. And I think it created this awareness like, wow, we really, we really need some better coping skills. If I don't want to live with this level of stress and worry every day, I'm going to need some real tools to train away from this. And so that's cultivated is really tapping into what are the things causing you this level of stress and worry? And in my coaching practice, what I started to notice was most people's primal fears, they actually fall into one of one or two of five different buckets. And it was so common, it was so universal that I thought, okay, well, this needs to go in the book because I need to teach people how to recognize their own self-sabotaging behaviors, how to recognize their own sets of fears and worrying thoughts. Because the thing about awareness is once you see something, you can't unsee it. Exactly. I talk about that all the time on here. It's so, and sometimes I'm like mad about that. I'm like, I don't want to, because it requires something that maybe I'm not ready to do, or maybe I don't want to do. I'm still fighting against, right? But it, it's for a purpose. And, and, and I know that, but yeah, that's totally true. You, once you see it, you can't unsee it. Yeah. And sure. Yeah. It can be irritating. And yeah, sometimes they suck, 
But that's the whole point of growing and moving beyond is you can, right. there's this whole concept of, um, there's a concept called Kensho versus Satori. And what it means is we can either choose to grow and evolve through insight. And if we choose not to do that and to ignore those feelings or those thoughts or whatever's popping into our awareness, we actually, the soul will move us through challenges and push us through pain and suffering until we learn it anyway. Right. So just take the easier road. I know I would. It feels a lot less awful. I know. I learned that the hard way. I, I started to notice that pattern many years ago when I started my journey. And I'm like, I don't want to face this yet. Here I am having to face it. And it almost feels worse than if I would have just faced it to begin with. Exactly. Exactly. And we all, you know, I mean, I'm sure everyone listening can go back into their life and think of one moment where they knew better and they did it anyway. And it ended up biting them the, you know what? And, right. uh, so the, the second module is really about how to tap into those patterns and recognize where you fit in and what's playing out in your life, whether it's in love and relationships, whether it's in how you manage your, your time and your energy, whether that's how you play things out at work or in your career or with your, your wealth and your money or your ability to accumulate wealth, how it plays out with your health, how you relate to others and, and to the world around you. And so now you go in and you figure out, okay, it gives you some tools into how to remove that. So I'll just give you one example or a couple of examples I can probably do um, in those five sort of primal fears. Well, we all know the feeling of not feeling enough. Most of us have had some flavor of that. I'm not lovable enough. I'm not smart Mm -hmm. enough, capable enough or deserving of that kind of success or deserving of that sort of love. Um, But that's a primal fear, and it doesn't always sound like that. Sometimes it can sound completely different, like, oh, I wish I could, you know, do this type of a holiday, or I wish I had this sort of a lifestyle, but I don't think wealth is for everyone. Okay, well, that's a story that can be rewritten. Right. So go back and just create an awareness and rewrite your stories about love and money and health and wealth and, and life in general and connection, then you can actually have whatever you want if you're able to pick up the obstacles to your success and move them, like destroy them. And so that second module is really about eliminating the noise and tapping into those fears. And then the W is, you know, what do you need? So I talked a little bit earlier about nobody really asks you, what do you need to be happy? So a whole series of exercises to take you deeper into your life to dissect. What do you need to feel like you're living your most vibrant life so that you wake up feeling excited about the day ahead so that you're living a life of adventure and passion and purpose if that's what interests you if what interests you is small and nature and stability build that but don't live somebody else's dream figure out what right. it is for you what's going to make you feel lit up and what's going to make you feel most alive and then build your life around that you'd be surprised to find how many people are just going on autopilot with the same old thoughts and feelings, living a life they think they should be living. And it's brought them no closer to happiness. Right. We can stop. And we get in that loop, right? And then we continue and we, and then we wonder why we're not getting something different. Yes. And then what you were saying earlier is, okay, now that you've removed all the noise, what do you do? And so that's the next three parts is, okay, now let's imagine a whole new life. We've pulled down your walls. And now you have a whole world of possibility around you. What do you really want? Like, what would really light you up? What would really excite you? And then some techniques for how to actually design that in your life. And then we go even further. So then the the last part is the the R and E, so in rewire. And the last R is to really cultivate a daily practice that you can continue on, something that's easy and simple for you to do It really just takes 10 or 20 minutes a day to either start your day off in a peaceful, calm and focused way, consciously choosing to think and feel the things that you wish to feel versus running on autopilot and and just letting that movie play out. I mean, I don't want a movie playing out and I'm just the black and white character meandering through my life. I want to be in that driver's seat. I want to I I want a charmed and excited life full of adventure. I will never settle for anything less. And I have no problems taking the action to get there. But most people don't know how to start, right? So this is like how to start defining that for yourself. And then lastly, okay, now we've moved the noise out of the way. 
you've learned to refocus and retrain the brain and the body back to calm, back to focus, back to productivity, boosted immune systems. Oh, and by the way, most physical ailments come from the fact that we haven't actually balanced our mental and emotional bodies. Yes. Chronic inflammation will go down. Your immune system will be boosted. Your ability to focus and be productive will heighten your, your, your brain's actual processing power is faster when you're calm versus stressed. You know, you can live in a moment of gratitude and love and abundance every day. And then the last part is, okay, now we've built this whole new life that excites you. How about we go bigger? How about we just like blow it out of the water and have you go through some, some exercises that make you realize like, what if it could be so much better than you can even possibly imagine now? And so it's a whole sort of cycle that takes people through a six week journey of really understanding. And there's, it's packed with so much research as well mm-hmm. that you know, it's data driven. So you can't argue yeah. it's not woo woo. This is not talking about spirituality. This is not forcing you to do yoga. If yoga doesn't work for you. Fine. Do, do whatever does work for you. Right. But give people the tools you need so that you can get on your way to happiness and success. I love, so, and think about that six weeks, I mean, six weeks to change your life. That's not that long, right? If you, if you're willing to step up and do that, I know when I went through my, um, uh, awakening, whatever you want to call it, it's been six or seven years ago now. I mean, I changed my life so fast, so fast in three months I had moved, sold my house, bought a new house, got a new job, a new city, all these things happened. And when we focus, when we get, fo- when we're ready to get focused, that's the other part of this, right? Nobody's, mm-hmm. you know, it, it's, everyone has a choice in this, but when we're ready to get focused um, and stop living on the sidelines, that that's how I often felt prior to changing my life was I was living on the sidelines and waiting for life to happen. And then finally I was like, well, this is the life. There's no, what am I waiting for? Right. And what I love about what you're talking about with your book and, and just really your approach is everything is so individualized. It it is literally wide open for anybody to create this, how it help how it works for them. There's, there's, you know, so many times over the years, there's been programs or whatever, you know, these, these, these things that people, um, you know, say we should do, we should do, I'm putting air quotes for those not watching the video. Um, but how many times have you done those things and knew it wasn't going to work for you, right? Like in your heart, like you knew, like, I'm not going to get up at 5.00 AM and work out every day, or I'm not going to only eat grilled chicken and broccoli every day, right? Like it, yeah. that, that those days are over, right? This is about making your life for you, what works for you. Absolutely. And it, it's, there's so much freedom in that too, right? We're, we're taking off all these layers, all these barriers. And, and even, you know, we were taught when I was talking about my, what I just went through about opening up more space. And, and part of what I also realized through that was I had so many other voices in my head that were caught like for, it's like they had been really far in the back of my mind, right? Like really far back there. And then as I started opening up more space, it's like those voices came further forward so I could identify what they were and be like, wait a minute, I don't even agree with that. Like that doesn't even, an example, my, my boyfriend and I were cooking and he was making something and he was pouring, um, you know, something in a pan and the pan was hot and he was pouring something in it and the, the steam came up. Right. And I started to feel myself get mad and annoyed. And I was like, wait a minute, we're ha- we're enjoying this. We're having a good time, right? We're cooking, we're, we're ha- having this time together hear my mom's voice in the back of my head, getting mad at me for when I did that, when I was a kid, like, and it, so it wasn't even my thing to be mad about. Right. Yeah. But I had taken this as if it was, and almost let that into that moment to potentially ruin the moment. Right. And I was like, wait a minute. No, I don't care. This is my house. If it steams up, I don't care. Right. So those voices that are back there in the back of our mind, when, when we start to do this kind of inner work and, and look at these things, I felt like, have felt like that those voices are easier to identify and have those fall away too, because we realize they're not our voice. Yeah. So that's such a great point. And it's such a great story that you just shared because, you know, I, I think when most people think that they're in control and they have these moments like you just did of, you know, well, that's not how I want to be thinking and feeling in this moment. I want to be enjoying this beautiful moment with, with my partner instead is, you know, before the age of seven, we are pure subconscious mind. 
So we're like, we're like a hundred percent sponge for everything we see here and feel around us. So whether it's watching a movie and somebody complaining about, you know, how to create money or struggle is the meaning of life, or, you know, only, only rich people, only rich people, uh, sorry, only uh, unscrupulous people can create that sort of wealth, whether it's your father or your cousin or your uncle or someone you spoke to at school. I mean, all of those things get absorbed into the subconscious. And this is really interesting if you think about it in this way. 5% conscious mind, 95% subconscious. And right. everything we hear is taken as a direct suggestion to our subconscious. You know, that whole idea of, you know, some illnesses are hereditary. And so if someone's saying you might have this condition, you can actually manifest that for yourself. If you yes. then tell yourself the story, I'm healthy and healing in every moment your body can do a completely different thing because our mind body connection is more powerful than I think we've even scratched the surface of. Yes. So mm -hmm. think about all of these fears and all of the, you know, all of that inner dialogue and all of those stories and thoughts and, and worrying feelings that show up in our lives, they all actually got programmed long before we could even understand that we were doing that. So if you can unpack that and realize it's not memory, we have 2 million bits per second of data coming at us any second. And the brain is only consciously able to process 134 bits, 134 bits out of 2 million. So what happens to the rest? Right. We distort it. We delete it. We generalize it. We capture the 134 and we, we catalog, catalog it as memory. But it's not actually memory. It can't possibly be 100% accurate if we've just erased over a million bits of information. Right. You can understand that and understand, you know, the data between how the brain actually encodes information and stores it as memory. Then you can go back and rewrite your story. So your story doesn't have to be the I'm not enough. That was, that was actually my story. I was born in South Africa during apartheid. So I think that's what set me down this path entirely was I had that feeling of not enough because at a very young age, I was exposed to things that are really just too complex to comprehend at such a young age, you know, right. frustration, discrimination, segregation. How do you, how do you process that at that age? When you're, when you're a small child, you just want to love and have fun and you want to laugh. That's it. Right. Life is pretty simple. Right. You know, and so to, you know, to think that how we're operating in this world today as adults came from a handful of experiences that stopped or slowed us down or, or dulled our shine at, at a young age before we were even consciously aware of how we chose those. We didn't, we, we subconsciously unawaring, you know, unknowingly chose a set of beliefs that would then operate us and run that movie in our life. Right. Well, if run you script, cut yeah. the projector off and just sit with yourself and it really doesn't take long. And I don't want things to be difficult. I don't want things to, to go in and be painful. If you can just create an awareness of what your pattern is, then you can change it. You know? Yes, I totally agree. That awareness is so key. And I know, um, I know we're coming up on time too, and uh, this is going really fast because this is just such a great conversation, but I wanted to touch on just a couple more things before, before we wrap up. Um, so when we talk about that subconscious and it's, you know, our brain is 5% awareness and then the 95% subconscious, um, what are some ways that we can let go maybe internally and start to develop that stronger connection with ourselves so that we can really, because it, it sometimes feels like when we hear that 5%, 95%, it feels like almost like, um, well, there's nothing I can do about it or it's, or I, I, I you know, it's, it's running its own show. So wh who am I, or what can I do about it? So are there ways that we can, first off, that's, that I'm sure that's, you know, that's not a true statement, but it's, it's one of those thoughts that want to come up to, to try to defeat us or, yes. you know, whatever our, our storyline we have going is, but what are some ways we can start to, to make that connection with ourselves to, um, to move, to, to change that subconscious that that's running in the background? 
I mean, that's a great question. And, and, and you're right. I mean, it can sound a little, you know, a little jarring, the five and 95%. It can sound almost immediately self-defeating, but it doesn't have to be that way. The important mm-hmm. thing to learn is, you know, it didn't matter if I was dealing with a, with a CEO of a, of a huge multinational or, you know, a lower level operator or middle manager, or just somebody that's come to me in my personal coaching practice that's starting a business. What I found was, all of these themes, the five primal fears that I talk about, um, they're universal. So we all have some experience of this and we all silently feel like we're struggling with it alone. Like everyone right. else knows the secret to life, but I right. that feels yep. like I can't do it, right? Well, you can't. All it takes is building some awareness. So if I talked about the, the not enough one, um, I'll give you another one that that might ring true for most people. And, you know, some people aren't feeling like they're deserving of wealth and success at a high level, or maybe, you know, but it doesn't always sound like that. It might sound like I said earlier, of you know, maybe I don't have the education or the resources, or I don't think I'm capable of achieving something that great. Well, there are lots of examples of just one. All it takes is just one person to break the mold. There's so many examples of people that had a high school education and managed to build multi-million dollar empires so if one person can do it, anyone can do it. Right. Uh, we, we never used to think of the, the 100 meter dash as something that anyone could break beyond 10 seconds. And then one guy did it and all of a sudden it's the new benchmark. It's the new standard. Right. Right. It's tapping into that universal consciousness of what's possible. So if you're given the tools to, to tap into where in those five primal fear buckets do you sit and how does it impact you in love in connection in terms of your your overall physical mental emotional health in terms of how you engage with life in terms of how you play with wealth most people that think they haven't got the ability to create wealth if you actually go back and rewrite your story and look for evidence to to support the contrary most people that believe that will for example you know they'll they'll find that they created a lot of wealth and then maybe lost it or right. over, or you know, just. But it's not that it's not possible. I once um, coached a, a person that was working in marketing, and he helped so many people, dozens and dozens of people, build multi-million dollar businesses. And when you know he was trying to figure out how can he make more money, and so I ended up coaching him. And it turned out that he had a subconscious belief that you know money is the root of all evil. Right. And so if you had it, it meant you weren't a good person and that you were doing something deceitful or, you know, that you lacked character or integrity. And so once we unraveled that, we actually went back through his financial history. He would made over $6 million and then quickly lost it oh, because wow. of his belief that he had he the loop. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so good people aren't deserving of money. <laughs> So we cleared that loop away and now he's, I mean, you can imagine where his business is at this right. point. So it's, yeah. you know, it's tapping into that and being able to move it aside. And then the second thing is, what are the tools you need to envision a new life? So if you can conceive of what that new life should look like, and there are tools in the book for how to go into visualization in a really clear way. And then there's also a set of affirmations so that you're rewiring that old thinking that feels like you're not deserving of love or wealth or success or that you're not safe or that you're not enough or whatever those, those primal fears are. And you're starting to rewire with some very powerful and carefully worded um, in terms of subconscious language you're installing a whole new set of thoughts. And with those thoughts come a whole new set of feelings because you have to embody them. And that's the secret sauce to affirmations. Affirmations don't really work if you don't believe them. You know, right. you can sit in front of a mirror and say a million things, but if you're not, you know, breathing them in and letting them that feeling of certainty vibrate through your body. So when you think about achieving that first milestone or the first million dollars. What does that feel like? What are you doing? I want you to imagine it as though you already have it. So what are you doing? Are you walking through your beach house out to the balcony and putting your feet in the sand? Are you turning the engine over in your brand new luxury car? Are you picking up your kids from school and and hitting the airport to take them on a glorious vacation? Like what are those really clear moments to get you in the headspace but powerfully in the mindset of creating what you want to achieve in your life, because you cannot be grateful and deserving and, you know, feeling loved 
and feeling stressed at the same time. Right. You feel stressed and joyful at the same time. But if you can pull yourself out of it and use these tools to step into a new mindset, you're pulling up your whole vibration and thoughts are energy. So you can create a whole new life for yourself. It really just takes 10 or 20 minutes per day. Which is amazing. And I mean, I, I can attest to that because I did it. And that, that's been uh, the reason I, I started this show was to be able to share that experience with other people and help other people see them do it too. And I think sometimes we're afraid to dream, right? We're afraid, we're afraid because we think we can't have it or whatever our story is. But it's so important to, to do this inner work because as I talked about earlier, having that space, that open space, after I had cleared out some of my own anxiety and fears, knowing what you want, you can, that's, that's what you can fill the space with, right? Like instead of living in that anxiety and fear, I'm living now in this space of, Oh, wait a minute. No, I'm visualizing this because this is what I want, but I had to get clear on that first, right? There had to be some clarity. There had to be the, the, the desire to sit down and think about, all right, so what, what did I want? I know what I don't want. So what is it that I do want? And so this, um, doing this inner work is to me has the, the times that I've been through this and, and, and experienced the biggest change is when I sat down and did this and I kept that my focus. I, I, I kept that as my, um, my anchor that moved me forward every day. Yes, absolutely. And if you can get yourself in the mindset. So, I mean, if I could give you three simple tools, I would say, wake up in the morning and, and really, instead of opening your phone and checking your emails or thinking about your day, don't immediately wake up and get stressed because then you're already living through the movie of your life. Right. You're just yeah. relooping again. Yeah. You're just triggering the loop again. So mm -hmm. you want to break that chain as soon as you wake up in the morning. That's number one. Take 10 to 15, 20 minutes, however long you have, even five minutes if you have it, and just focus on how you want to feel instead. Focus on peaceful, happy, calm, focus. Those are the ones that work for me in the morning. And then start to imagine your day just coming together easily, effortlessly, successfully, whatever it is you're going to do, whether it's a meeting or, you know, a meeting at school with the teachers or working with the kids or whatever it is you're doing in your life, just set your intentions for the day to start your day off in the right state of flow so that you're in the driver's seat so that you're consciously thinking and feeling. And if you're thinking and feeling differently in a more empowered way, there's no way that your actions won't line up for that. Right. Right. I and totally agree. Is when you get stuck or feel stressed throughout the day, take 60 breaths, neurohack that parasympathetic response, calm, bring yourself back to calm. That's where you're going to get your focus. If you, if you're trying to focus while stressed, very difficult to do. And then the third thing is daydream, mm -hmm. just daydream. So how you set your intentions throughout the day, focus on those goals. It doesn't have to be in a meditation. It can be while you're driving. Imagine yourself in that first milestone when you hit it. Imagine what you will be doing, what will you see, what will you hear, what you feel. And every time you spend time sitting in that new mindset, you're rewiring the brain. Yeah. You're rewiring the brain for a new outcome, for a more powerful you, for a more vibrant you. And then the more you do that over time, that becomes the path of least resistance. The that one that becomes the new you. Yeah. That's mm -hmm. your new reality. Totally. So you'll wake up next after just a few weeks and you'll already feel peaceful, happy, calm with that inner knowing that you can, that feeling like, what if you couldn't fail? Yeah. No, what if no. I get to win for once, right? Like it's yeah. time that I win. It's not, we've, we've lived so, so many years of our lives with, uh, with going outside of ourselves. And when we go in, um, we get, to, we have the control, we take our own control back and, um, that's an amazing place to be. I mean, and I mean, we could talk for hours about this, um, <laughs> but, um, we're coming down to the end here. And my guest this week has been Zara Carson. And we've been talking about what is happiness worth to you? I think, as I talked about at the beginning of the show, there's, there's so many things that we say we want, right. Myself included in this. And, um, sometimes our behaviors, our thoughts don't line up to that. So if we really want to be really want to be happy, like we say we do, um, what's that worth to us? Is it worth picking up a book like Zahara's six days to, or six weeks to happy and, and taking some of these steps in your own life to start to get a different, different results, a different reality. So 
Zahara, I, again, this conversation has been amazing. Um, can you tell the little, the listeners a little bit about how they can um, find out more about you and, and get your book? Of course. Well, you can go to getzen.com. That's the word get and then the word zen with a D on the end, or just go to sixweekstohappy.com. And I invite you all to start that journey today. I promise you all it takes is 18 strategies, six weeks, 10 minutes per day, and your life will change forever. Don't wait. No, I love it. I absolutely love it. Well, and congratulations to you on the success of the book. You've got so many great reviews. I know you've helped a lot of people. So congratulations. Oh, thank you so much. And thank you for having me. It's been such a pleasure. Of course. It was such a great conversation. Thank you. All right. That was my interview with Zara Carson. We were talking about what is happiness worth to you? I think this is such a great question. We're starting 2022, um, but this can be done if you're listening to this at any time in the year, this, this journey of moving to happiness is so important. Important isn't even the word it, it's, it's critical. It's, it's required of us now. I think it's, uh, as we talked about in, in the episode about, um, you know, ha- happiness being an afterthought, most of our lives or happiness being something that, um, would come when we got the things right. But, um, I think we've all probably realize that's not the case <laughs> that happiness doesn't come with the things happiness starts within with ourselves. And like I talked about having that being friends with yourself, being able to be at home with yourself and, and within yourself and, um, being able to rest there without the anxiety and the fear. And so I hope you found this episode, uh, as powerful as, as I did to, to talk to Zahar about, I think it's, um, happiness is, uh, like I said, it's a requirement going forward. So, um, thanks for listening this week. And if you'd like to learn more about me, you can visit my website, sloanfremont.com. You can sign up on the right-hand side where you can get access to my newsletter. And every time I have a new podcast episode, you'll be notified. I also have the create what you speak Academy. You can visit create what you speak.com. And what goes along with our talk today about uh, what happiness is worth to you. I have a program called the BS method, the better stories method. And I teach you how to tell yourself a better story in five minutes or less. And yes, it is possible. It can be done. It's the exact steps that I use to change my life. And I give you all the scripts that, that are needed to do this. I give you um, exercises. I have a lot of examples. I have a lot of different ideas in there for you, uh, worksheets, all of it's done for you. So if you if you've visit the bsmethod.com and you'll find out more about that. So, all right, that's it for this week. Again, thanks for listening and please be sure to join us next week where I will continue to give you real life tips on how to live free in what feels like an unfree world. 